Instagram. This video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your health plan. Hey beautiful soul, it's Jacqueline from the Las Lipia Chronicles in partnership with Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. If you have lichen sclerosis and are looking to empower yourself with information, find acceptance and reclaim your life, then please subscribe to our channel and keep on watching. And if you have a friend, family member or loved one with lichen sclerosis and you want to learn more about the physical and mental health aspects of living with lichen sclerosis so that you can better support them in their journey, then please keep on watching and please share this channel with them as well. All right, so today's video is a tip video. I'm going to run you through 10 tips for managing and helping to take the edge off that itch, and you know what I'm talking about, with lichen sclerosis. As always, if you find the information in this video helpful, please give us a like, please subscribe, and please feel free to share in the comments what helps you with itch, what tips you may have. Again, I always say sharing is caring and this community is beautiful, so please drop what works for you in the comments below. Before I begin with the tips, I wanna just really quickly address the question, why do we itch? What is What's behind all this maddening itching that we feel? So lichen sclerosis causes something called lichenification, which is essentially thickening and hardening of our tissue. In this case, the vulvar tissue gets really thick, really scarred, really rigid. Now, this is really important. Um, you may not see that skin thickening with your eyes when you're doing a kind of vulvar self-exam, but underneath that superficial layer, there's a lot of thickening. In fact, the average stratum corneum, for which is like, like upper top layer of uh, vulvar skin, is several times thicker than healthy tissue. So we're talking, when we talk LS, there's, there's a lot of thickening involved. Why is this important? Thick skin equals itchy, irritated skin. Thick skin itches. So that's a big piece of why we itch. So tip number one, as always, probably goes without saying, but I'm gonna keep saying it because it's important. Proper and consistent use of your treatment plan is so, so, so important. So your treatment plan is there to help reduce inflammation and control your symptoms and slow the progression of lichen sclerosis. Super important that we get on top of that inflammation. When you control the inflammation, you control the symptoms. So then as you're controlling and managing and reducing that inflammation, as you're kind of making some repairs to that thick lichenified layer of skin, the itch can kind of slowly start to settle. So proper and consistent use, incredibly important. Tip number two is to refrain from scratching. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. Girl, the itch is so intense. How can I do anything but scratch? I know it's hard, but as much as possible, it is really important to refrain from rubbing and scratching the vulvar area. What happens when we rub and scratch the skin is that this can cause mast cells to kind of activate in that area. Now mast cells, they secrete a protein called histamine and histamine makes us itch even more. So now because of that histamine, we've got more itch. Now we want to scratch even more, more aggressively that results in more mast cells and more histamine. And that's kind of essentially how that itch scratch cycle develops and why it's this almost addictive, you know, scratch kind of process. And so it's so critical to break that cycle. Another reason why it's important to refrain from itching, uh, from scratching, not only because scratching can actually make the itch intensify and make it worse, but another reason we want to refrain from scratching is because lichen sclerosis skin is prone to fissuring and tearing and blistering and bruising. So oftentimes what you can see is that folks will scratch and then they'll have bruising in the area or tears and fissures and cracks in the skin. So now not only is that skin itchy, but that skin is painful. 
Also, for folks that scratch a lot, you can actually start to develop thickened patches of skin. Um, so increasing that, that kind of thickness there. So there's a lot of reasons why scratching as much as you can. It's so important to refrain and just, you know, distract, do whatever you got to do, but try your best not to, it, not to scratch the itch. Number three is to try soaking either in a sitz bath or a regular bath. This one was always kind of hit or miss with me. It never really seemed to give me that much relief, but I'm mentioning it because a lot of folks in the community say that soaking in a warm bath can really help, or sometimes folks even soak in a cool bath, like not freezing, but the water's cool. Um, so some folks find relief in that. So that is why I am mentioning that, just kind of soaking and letting things kind of just calm down a little bit in the bath most people say that they'll do like they'll put some salts like epsom salt or maybe some sea salt or some folks will put like chamomile tea or something in there i typically just don't put anything in the bath when i soak i just usually go warm water i will say if you're going to use any kind of salts like epsom salt those can be drying so if you're soaking in epsom salt and you find that helpful great but when you get out, make sure that you're putting on um, an emollient. You really need to moisturize that area because the salts can be very drying. So now if we have that really dry skin, it's going to be irritated and itchy. So we definitely don't want that. So we want to immediately kind of get that moisturizer or barrier cream on that area. Tip number four is to use an emollient. So I definitely just mentioned using an emollient, especially if you're going to soak and soak in epsom salt or sea salt because of how drying it can be but steroids also have a slight drying effect on the skin and skin that is really dried out tends to be more irritated and just really doesn't do well with friction so what we always suggest is to use a vulvar emollient which is essentially a vulvar moisturizer we do we're going to have a video coming up on that so i will um, have a video where I kind of go through the differences between emollients, barrier creams, and solves and bombs. Um, I do have a video explaining the importance of emollients on my YouTube channel, so I will link that up above for you to check out in the meantime. But a lot of these moisturizers do have components in them that are meant to kind of soothe the skin, cool the skin. There are products like Rescue Balm that have oatmeal and ingredients in there to actually help um, soothe and bring down the itch a little bit so you know there's so many different types of emollients out there i always tell folks there's no wrong or right emollient for you the best emollient for you is the one that works for your budget for your lifestyle and for your body there's no right thing or wrong thing you can use coconut oil you can use v magic you can use whatever you want as long as your body reacts well Tip number five is to use ice. This full transparency was almost the only thing that helped me when my itch was really, really bad. This is my go-to if ever there's any itch or frankly, any pain, burning discomfort, but definitely for the itch, ice packs were my best friend. Now, early in my LS days, I would just shove a bag of peas or whatever was in my freezer and just like between my thighs and just to the pelvic area region uh, and that was really the only thing that provided any kind of relief for me now what i actually use is a product called private pack so this is my private pack right now it is in this protective cloth layer but if i remove it we can see that it's actually a gel pack like this it's starting to defrost because it's been sitting outside of my uh, freezer for a couple of minutes, but we can see here that they're really designed to fit the genital pelvic area. So from the clitoris to the anus, um, they're very discreet. You can put those in your underwear. The new versions have um, little wings so that you can kind of attach it to the underwear. So I could be wearing it now. I'm wearing a dress. I could be wearing it now as I'm giving this talk. I can be wearing it when I'm working at my desk, walking around in my house. I've definitely worn one out a really hot summer day i wore one when i went to go have coffee with a friend i use them after i get hair removal i use them all the time 
Um, but they're just, they're such a godsend. I have about five sitting in my freezer at all times so that I can have this like assembly line of ice packs for if ever I get into a flare and I'm itchy because they'll last, you know, and you don't want to ice like continuously. So I'll do like 20 minutes, you know, one will kind of lose its coldness and then I'll take a new one out and just, that's what I mean by my assembly line. I kind of like rotate them so that I've always got one ready to go. So um, if you're interested in getting private packs, I do have a discount code. So you can go to privatepacks.com and then at checkout, you'll use my discount code, all capital letters, the Lost Labia Chronicles. I'll put that info in the description box below if you want to get those. But those have been a godsend for me with pain and itch. Tip number six is to use an oral antihistamine. Now, this is something that I wouldn't necessarily recommend as like a long-term thing, but more so as a short-term thing to help manage and take the edge off the itch initially. So early in my LS diagnosis, when I finally got my diagnosis and I started using steroids, as I've mentioned on my blog and on my Instagram, my steroids didn't just work magic right off the bat. It took a few months for my symptoms to start to settle. And I actually experienced a worsening of symptoms initially when I used my clobetasol. So it's almost like in my experience, it needed to get worse before it got better. So I experienced an increase in pain and stinging and in the itch and discomfort and all of these things. And so I was really struggling with the itch. And so in addition to the ice packs, so for me, it was like two, these were these were my hand in handers for the first two months. So I would use my ice packs, but I also used oral antihistamines. So during the day, I would use something like Claritin or Blexton that have a non-drowsy effect because I need to be coherent for my day job. I can't be snoozing at my keyboard. And then at night, I would actually take Benadryl. Um, I preferred Benadryl at night because not only did it give that anti-itch um, component, but there's also that drowsy, you know, it can help with sleep. So having that, and we know, not we know, but most folks with LS, they will say that their itch gets worse at night. And so to have something that's working on the itch, but something that's also helping me get more sleep, that's why I did it kind of that way. Now I knew when I was doing it, I told myself, you know, this is not a long-term solution. This is what I'm doing right now so that I can cope, manage, and get by. Um, that said, one thing I will say is that if you're going to do this, I would have a conversation with your pharmacist first, just to make sure you don't have any contraindications for any of these medications. Um, and I would also, you know, they can, they can kind of review your list of current medications and just make sure that there's no interactions that you need to be wear, wary of or anything like that. It may be that they'll say, oh, you can't use this oral antihistamine, but you can use this one. This one's safe for you, but this one isn't. So definitely always, you know, from a safety perspective, I always want to, you know, advise folks or encourage folks to have those kind of conversations with your pharmacist first to really put your safety and health um, in the front seat in making this decision. Tip number seven is to wear really loose and comfortable clothing. I am wearing a very, you can't really tell, but it's a very loose, flowy maxi dress. Um, and I will often wear these, especially in the summer, and I'll just go commando. So there's a lot of breathability. There's no fabric that's really rubbing up against the vulvar tissues. So they really get to just chill there and do their own thing. Um, so, you know, whether it's that or really loose slacks, really uh, some folks like to wear boxers, like big boxers um, and then like baggy pants over them. Just wear whatever is breathable, loose and comfortable. Typically, if you're really itchy, the last thing you want is fabric rubbing up and aggravating it. It can often make it worse. So during that period where you're very itchy, I would you know wear more loose clothing. Now that I'm not itchy, right? For folks that know I've been in remission for over three years, haven't had any symptoms or complications in over three years. So now I can wear anything. Like I can wear leggings, I can wear tight clothes, I can wear different types of underwear. Um, so that's fine. But if I were to go into a flare and if I was itchy, I'm gonna knock on wood, one, two, three, 
because I'm superstitious like that. Um, but if I were to go into a flare, I would probably temporarily shift back to more breathable, looser clothes, going commando more often until I could get that itch to kind of settle back down again. Tip number eight is to make sure you don't have a secondary condition going on. So this is something that I'm really passionate about talking about because what I find is that there's this tendency of, okay, I have LS, therefore any symptom I experience from now into the future has to be due to my lichen sclerosis. But that's not always the case. Folks with lichen sclerosis can still get yeast infections and other vulvovaginal conditions. So it's always important to know what's going on down there so we can treat appropriately. Because for example, if you have a yeast infection, so you start, you start you're, you're, you're chill, you don't really have much itch, and then all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, I'm in a flare, I'm super itchy, what the F, it's gotta be LS. Okay, fair. So you throw a bunch of steroids at it and you're still not improving. Then it's like, to me, I would start to wonder, is this LS or do I have something else? Because if it is yeast, throwing epic metric tons of steroids at it is not gonna help. In fact, it may worsen the yeast infection. Um, yeast infections require antifungals, not steroids. And that's why it's really important to be able to differentiate what is what and what's kind of going on. I do have a post on differentiating yeast from lichen sclerosis, as well as what to do if you experience chronic yeast and lichen sclerosis. I highly recommend checking that out. It's lostlabia.com forward slash yeast infection. I will leave that linked in the description box below. Another thing that can sometimes happen for folks is that they say, you know, oh, my doctor said my skin looks wonderful, but I am still experiencing symptoms. What's going on? Um, and again, what's going on may in fact be a secondary condition such as overactive pelvic floor, so really tight pelvic floor muscles. It could be central sensitization where the kind of pain signals get amplified. So there's tons of other things that can be going on in the background. And it's always so important to find a specialist that's able to differentiate these things so that you can properly treat them. Now, Lichen Sclerosis Support Network does have a series of blogs that kind of differentiate LS and other conditions. So we have one on lichen sclerosis and lichen planus, lichen sclerosis and lichen simplex chronicus, lichen sclerosis and menopause slash GSM, which is genitory syndrome of menopause. And we're just going to keep expanding on that with different vulvar conditions. So definitely stay tuned for those as more of those go out. Hopefully that starts helping to kind of differentiate between these different conditions because it really is important. Sometimes the itch is actually not coming from lichen sclerosis and therefore it's really important to get to the bottom of it so that you can treat it properly. Tip number nine is medication. Now, when I say medication, I'm meaning this in a really short-term burst, but sometimes for folks who really have a hard time breaking that itch scratch cycle whose itch is really intense and they really struggle to resist that urge to scratch sometimes medications like low dose amitriptyline can be prescribed to help reduce that itch therefore you don't scratch as much and that kind of helps break that cycle typically when that cycle is broken they will discontinue the medication it's really just something that's given more upfront to help break that cycle and then you just continue. This would be used in conjunction with your steroids. Amitriptyline would be oral, although you can get it compounded into a cream. But typically when it's an itch and not pain thing, typically it's more gonna be prescribed orally. I've actually taken amitriptyline for over four years, uh, not related to lichen sclerosis. This was actually as part of a cocktail for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and I forget my dosing. It was still, it was on the low perspective because it's a tricyclic antidepressant. And when those are prescribed for like neuropathic itch or neuropathic pain, it's a low dose of it. Um, I will say that amitriptyline did help me sleep quite a bit. It definitely helped that. So it also can make you a little bit drowsy. It's something typically you're going to take before bed. And then so it can also help with sleep, which again is good because itch tends to be a little bit worse at night. So again, you can always talk to your doctor and see and explore 
the avenue of different medication options that may be available to you. Again, these are typically short term. These are not meant as long term solutions. They're really just help to get you over that initial hump and then you're taken off of them and then you're just managing with steroids and emollient and whatever kind of care your treatment plan includes. The last tip, which is tip number 10, is medical hypnosis. No, this is not what you traditionally see depicted on TV with the cartoon characters and the clock thing or whatever it is that they do to do the hypnosis. It's quite different. Um, I've never done it. I will say that I want to do it for a variety of things. And if you've ever done medical hypnosis, please share your experience in the comment section below because I would love to hear about this. I was first introduced to medical hypnosis actually when I became a part of a pain education program at Mount Sinai Hospital. I was in that program for about a year and this involved a lot of patients with serious, serious chronic pain and some of these patients used medical hypnosis and the psychologist leading the program would often make reference to medical hypnosis when relevant. So what medical hypnosis does, it is essentially helps you um, look at a problem and work towards its resolution while being and maintaining a very comfortable, safe sense of your physical space. And it can also help you enhance your control over your body and your bodily sensations. So I have heard some people using it um, in the context to the problem being the scratching, the resolution being to break that itch scratch cycle. I have heard of a couple people that have done that. Um, for different kind of itchy skin conditions um, who reported it to be really, really helpful. So if you are having a hard time breaking that itch scratch cycle, and if you tend to be someone that doesn't really want to go on medication or rely on pharmaceuticals, then this might be a great non-pharmaceutical option for you to explore. Um, I don't know how popular these kind of clinics are. I live in a really big city and I know we have a couple. So um, you may need to look around a bit. You may need to talk to your primary care physician to see if they can recommend anything. But this might also be, you know, a good non-pharmaceutical option for you to explore. All right, so that is it for this video. Those are my top 10 tips for managing itch with lichen sclerosis. I hope some of those tips help you out. I hope you can pick and choose and find something that works and that helps you. Um, of course, if there's a tip I didn't mention that is like gold for you, please share it in the comment section below so that others can kind of learn from our community. And that is it for this one. I will catch you in the next one. Thank you.